Welcome to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. We interview great guests who inspire you to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Be sure you visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, just relax as you listen. You can do something else, but be ready to make an important note. And let's get started. The title of this interview is Betrayal Blindness and Betrayal Trauma. We'll be speaking about somatic trauma and how it's something relatively recently discovered. And my guest is Mr. J, or he's also called Mr. J, the coach. Is that correct? Coach J, Mr. J. Coach Penny J. J. That's great. But I can tell you, I've just met him very recently and we have a lot in common. And I, I bet during this, com- this conversation, we'll discover much more. So let me tell you about Mr. J. He is a betrayal trauma practitioner and intrapersonal relationship coach. He holds a master's degree in education, is ministry credentialed, a certified special education teacher, and author of a children's book called I Am Loved Right Where I Am. Excellent. A veteran of the U.S. military. I love that too. I, I, I love everything about this guy. I mean, as you can you'll discover, uh, and he's an inspirational public speaker, a, an adoptive parent, and much more. But his childhood was anything but success. After years of drugs, alcohol, and years in special ed, Mr. J quit school in sixth grade, ultimately, ultimately living on the streets falling victim to abuse after abuse. After the second gun to his temple, I've had I've had actually almost all of these, Jay, so we've got a lot in common. Um, oh. Mr. J vowed to fix himself so he could help fix others. Determined, Mr. J put himself through school, researching self-help books, therapy, psychology, and spirituality, all that. I mean, this is, I mean, I can, this almost is like my resume. So we're, we're simpatico, sir. Mr. J learned and stands by his motto. The relationship you have with yourself sets the tone and standard for all other relationships around you and says relationships can break you, but even broken crayons can create beautiful masterpieces. That is wonderful. Great stuff. Welcome, Mr. J. Thank you, Tony. Maybe you're a brother from another mother, you know, who knows? I, I think so. Let me let me shut this window. I've got the... Uh, you do neighbors, your thing. Some neighbors that are getting apparently a little rowdy. <laughs> and they're not even speaking English. That's okay. Um, well, very, if you're not English, you're just going to hear some cows mooing, so we're good. <laughs> very good. So uh, I love your background, and, and I relate to it so much. But, you know, this conversation is not going to be about me. It's going to be about you and what people can get from you in terms of uh, value in their own lives. And I got a feeling it's going to be a a great amount. So, um, I mean, you're a relationship coach and and a betrayal expert. Uh, Do you find that they both, uh, you work as both simultaneously sometimes or are are they usually separate? So all the above, you know, um, a couple of things. I, I, I spent many years as an intrapersonal relationship coach. And what that is, is helping people um, get to know themselves, understand themselves. Because I always say, like you just read, you know, um, understanding yourself sets the tone and the standard for all other relationships around you. If we don't know our own love language, how can we expect other people to feed us love? If we don't know our attachment style, how are we going to know what kind of people that we look for or what potential abusive relationships we can get into because, you know, the attachment styles um, conflict um, or attachment styles along with other various, um, you know, uh, things. So we really have to get to know ourselves, not only at the core of who we are today, Tony, but also we have to continually get to know who we are because you're not the same person today than you were five years ago. And you're not going to be the same person five years from now than you are today. I always say, we're not just human beings. We're human involvements. We grow, we learn, we evolve. We not only have to get to, to know the continuous person where we are and we're becoming, but if we're in a relationship, we have to continue 
continually get to know our new our partner. So adulting is not fun. It's a lot of work. And we got to pull up our big girl and big boy pants and do a lot of work. And that's why I'm here. Now, the betrayal aspect came up, uh, long story short, a couple of years ago, I lost my father abruptly. And when I mean abruptly, I mean, I was having a conversation with him on the phone one day laughing. And four days later, they were lowering his dead body into the ground. Wow. And a couple of days after that, I woke up in a, with a panic attack in the middle of the night. Now, Tony, I've heard about panic attacks, never had one. And oh, boy, will smoking. I never you know, it's downplay just, them. It's just incredible. The more and more, I, I, you're telling my story. And, you know, you know, I used to be an AA and NA years ago. And they used to say, keep on c coming back. You'll hear your story. I never heard my story. Not that I didn't get value. I certainly, I, but of course, but you, quite frankly, I've never had, I've got, I've had so much commonality with my guests, but I don't, I don't think ever as much as this. I've never, I've, I've, I'm an ex paratrooper, a second airborne infantry. I've never been, had never had anxiety in my life. Only in the last eight, nine months, I've, I wake up with anxiety. I've never, I was like, what the hell is this? I'm not, it's foreign to me. So, so please continue. Yeah. So, so this is what was interesting about three days after my father died and we buried him, I woke up in the middle of the night from a panic attack. Now I've never had a true panic attack. They really truly feel like you are dying of a heart attack. I mean, they are no joke, but this is what was interesting. I smelled smoke. I woke up cause I smelled smoke. I jumped out of bed. I have two young kids. I jumped out of bed and I'm going in the kitchen. I'm going in the living room. I'm going in the dining room. I'm opening my door to see if my neighbors are, you know, uh, have their fireplace on. Try as I might, I cannot find the origin of this smoke. Oh my God. There was no smoke in my house. When I went to lay back down, all of a sudden I was transported, Tony, back to when I was six years old, standing next to my mother as she stood by our house that burned down in flames. So my body was reliving the unhealed trauma of when I was six years old and it oh, came up after my father died. So that's when I decided, holy crap, I need to deal with my trauma. And that led me onto this long road, which I won't get into the you know boring details of becoming a certified betrayal trauma practitioner. Wow, that's fantastic. What a, that's far more than anecdotal because there's, there's great stuff in there to, that people can garner stuff, you know? And well, let me back up a bit and counter to you. First of all, that was one of the first things I loved, I learned in, in a, when I, be, I started a commitment to personal development is that everything comes from the self. I'm not going to have any love for anybody else if I don't have it for myself. Everything that I, that I do car, comes is a reflection of an internal, an internal situation or internal thought process. Uh, I learned that and that was a critical thing. That's why, you know, working on the self, personal development, using self-help, whatever is a critical thing, because the more you want out of life, the more you're going to, you have to get out of yourself to, in order to get that. Uh, in terms of evolution, absolutely. I've learned that about myself. I'm, you know, you know, one of the things people say, oh, yo, you know, climate change, like, like they're telling some revelation. Okay. Well, change, by the way, has been perpetual since day freaking one for the world and for the self. Change Correct. is constantly, it's a cliche, yeah. but it's true. And we're changing. We have to be able to adapt to our own changes and communicate it to a, both ourselves and the others because they, can, they might say, hey, this is not, I don't know who this is. I'm not used to this. You know, and like, well, this is what's going on with me now. So you have to communicate as well. But, you know, I love, I, I want to say finally that, you know, as an NLP practitioner and as a person who's had a certain evolution, you know, I always say that, okay, thoughts uh, are what precede feelings. I mean, yes, we can be, have condition, but if you, I want to change a feeling, I change my thought. But when I had sure. these recent anxieties at night, I wake up claustrophobic. I would do this process and, uh, and I find that the feelings were, were persistent. So it was deeper things going on. I was like, okay, well, hap what happened to your fancy uh, uh, methodologies now, Tony? Where are you now? You, you've got a feeling that, that's unwanted and you're not able to get rid of. So sometimes you've got to get more help. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Listen, uh, you just reminded me of uh, one of my favorite sayings. It's from a, a child, a child psychologist. He He's said going, before. Yeah. yeah, he said before kids, I had um, six theories on how to raise kids. He said, now I have six kids and no theories. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But, you know, another thing, too, is you're right about um, the the um, listen, I, you know, you're reading my bio. And, you know, I did quit school in sixth grade and I was in special ed for a lot of years. But bottom line, 
you know, I do have a master's degree. I do have um, several life coaching degrees. I am certified as a, you know, uh, betrayal trauma practitioner. I am a published author. I actually have a, a, a dance CD out there too, but we won't get on that. But here's the deal, <laughs> to be honest with you, Tony, in the grand scheme of things, nobody really cares. Nobody really cares because here's the deal. What people want to know when they're across from me is do you understand where I am and can you help me get out of where I am? They don't care if I have a triple doc. Well, I always tell people the, the best degree that I have is a doctorate in, from the School of Hard Knocks, which is the which is the degree I'm most proud of. But people don't really, I mean, you know, seriously, when you're when you are um in in a plane. Do you really care much about the pilot if they're black or white or gay or straight or Republican or Democrat? You just want the most qualified person uh, and the most second, qualified. Jay, I will not fly on a plane with a Republican as the pilot. No, I'm totally, <laughs> totally joking, of course. Uh, absolutely. But, yeah, course. you want the most qualified. So here's the deal. When somebody's sitting across from me, and I'll, and here's the deal, Tony. It's like this. If you're talking to a female who, God forbid, lost a child, right? Let's just say they lost a child. Um and they're talking to you and you didn't lose a child, you can give them sympathy and empathy and nod your head yes and all this other stuff. But boy, is it a completely different uh, conversation when they're talking to somebody else who also lost a child. Absolutely. So people, Absolutely. people want relatability even over likability. So um, I think the fact that, you know, I tell people all the time, I've been a betrayal trauma coach for a couple of years However, I've been training for it for over 40. And that's what people want is, do you, have you been where I am? Can you understand the depth, the profound pain, the damage, the destruction, how this betrayal has ravished my body and my life? Do you get that? And once you say, trust a brother, I can, now we can start working together and moving forward. I totally concur. I, that, I think that's perhaps my greatest asset is through all the adversity that I've been through and how I pulled my, you know, and for the most part, work work myself out of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got all these certifications and this and, and and you know and these this long time resume of personal development, but it's just my, I would say, depth of understanding, which comes from experience, as you just described, uh, which is perhaps the most valuable thing I, I have to offer somebody. And of course, I bring my expert tool. You know, when I was a life coach, I'm not a life coach anymore. Now I'm the head of a technological coaching company striving to launch a revolutionary app that's going to transform self-help. Nice. But enough, oh, wait, enough. Well, you'll learn more about that in the future, Jay. But uh, but it's my it's an ability to understand. You know, it's one of, you know, self-help, most I contend that most people are not into self-help primarily because they have a fear of failure. Why do this if, I, if, if I'm going to fail anyway, uh, and, and, which is something I fear? And of course, there's other reasons too, but I would I contend that's the, the most common. But even less people want coaches, even though I feel the coaching field is continuously growing, is because they, uh, they fear uh, being judged or being accountable to a person when they fear they're going to fail. Uh, and which, of course, as you and I would immediately say, any coach that judge the, judges their client is a terrible, terrible coach, <laughs> right? But, uh, but my, my app, Proficio, is going to change that because it's going to remove the human, the human thing. But however, there is nothing like the expert, like you and I, that can understand, that can, not sympathy, sympathy is, is this, empathy is everything you know, empathize and really understand the nuances of someone's experience because they have a great relation. And then of course, bring their expertise to bear. Yeah, yeah, most certainly. You know, I think one of the reasons also, to be honest with you, why people um, are kind of shy away from um, self-help is because Tony, it's the same reason why I think depression skyrocketed during COVID is because when you put a mirror in front of somebody, oftentimes they don't like the reflection that's looking back at them. Oh, and, um, and, you know, it's interesting because I get a lot of couples, I get a lot of couples, because I deal with a lot of infidelity, a lot of infidelity, that's probably 90% of my, my calls. I get a lot of couples who will reach out to me and want to book a couple session. Um, and really what they really want is they really want me for that hour to tell the person who stepped out of the relationship, bad, you're bad, you're a bad person, you hurt this. And that they're my, and here's the deal. I'm like, listen, there's individual issues 
there's marital issues and then there's betrayal issues. I can't focus just on one. I got to focus on all three because that's the, that's the best. It's like when you go to the hospital with a third degree burn, they just don't put a bandaid on it and say, good luck. No, they got to take out a scouring pad and they got to scrub that third degree burn. It doesn't feel good. Healing after betrayal, self-help, becoming a better person does not feel good. Absolutely. Nothing feels good. Absolutely. Whether you're the betrayed, the betrayer, self-help, it doesn't matter. We, and, and you want to know why, Tony? Because we are creatures of habit and familiarity. Let me just do a quick thing for you. Fold your arms right now, if you don't mind. Fold your arms. Okay. So your arms are folded. You're relatively comfortable, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now fold them the other way. Right, right. Uh, right. I've done this exercise many times and I still can't do it right now. <laughs> okay. So, so, so long story short, you want to go back to what's familiar. Well, that's the deal with self-help and that's the thing with healing. And that's the thing with moving forward is that we always want to go back to what's familiar. Yes. So, um, yes. you know, we want to work on our marriage and I tell people, um, listen, Tony, if I were to ask the average couple, give me a list of all the things you don't like about their spouse, they will come back with 10 novels. When I ask, when I say, now bring me back a list of all the things you love about their spouse, they'll come back with a handful of things. What they want to do is everybody's like, I want to have a happy marriage. I want to have, I want to be loved and secure and this and this and this and that. And then they go back to defensiveness and contempt and anger. And, and I'm like, whoa, that's familiar behavior, but it's not healthy behavior. We want to move forward. We have to undo those familiar patterns. And like I just did with the folding of the arms, we always want to go back to what's familiar because the unfamiliar is uncomfortable. If we want to get comfortable, we got to temporarily allow ourselves to get uncomfortable. Absolutely. You know, it's, I mean, there's some understanding about it, but it's wild. It's wildly either misconstrued or just as people avoid it, but all the growth happens in, in, a, in the discomfort zone, but that's not to say that you must stay uncomfortable to grow. No, you grow in discomfort and then you relax in comfort, but you grow, but all the growth has to be where there's no comfort that the other, cause it's unfamiliar. Just as you talked about, you must get out there and then you can relax a little bit. Right. And, you know, as long as you're not doing the old one step forward, two step back routine, which is extremely common, you know, two step forward, one step back. Fine. <laughs> you, that's yeah. great progress, but you've got to get in that uncomfort and, you know, in, in that discomfort and the healing process to, to really, you know, to heal other than the superficial, you know, epidermis, what's going on beneath that. That's where, you know, the real, the, the real scar tissue is, you know, for deeper wounds that is not comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let me just tell you real quick um, uh, what I do for the most part. So Please. I am a I am a betrayal trauma practitioner. So what does that mean? That means that I simply help people help themselves. I do nothing. I tell people all the time, all I am is the captain of the ship. All I do is steer, but I can turn that um, wheel left and right. And we're going nowhere if you guys don't row. So the, the couple or the person has to put in all of the work. I just simply steer the ship. That's all I do. But I'm a betrayal trauma practitioner. So what does that mean is I help people help themselves move forward through the stages and phases up from betrayal to breakthrough. Now, what is betrayal trauma? Well, trauma, in, and I can give you the DSM definition or I can give you Mr. J's definition. Basically, trauma is anything that overwhelms our coping mechanisms. Trauma could be different for different people. You could experience something and I can experience the same thing. I could have trauma, you, you don't have trauma. If trauma is, is not what happens to us, it's how our nervous system responds to it for the most part. Um, now, what is betrayal trauma? Betrayal trauma is life-altering helplessness, life powerless, life uh, changing powerlessness. And what I mean by powerlessness is um, when we ex experience betrayal, uh, one of the core things that happens is our choices were completely robbed from us. Which, by the way, is why one of the things that I have people do is give is empower themselves with the gift of choice. But anyways. So betrayal trauma. Now, what exactly is betrayal trauma? Let me give you a visual of what betrayal trauma is. Imagine that um, you have two young kids and you are a mile above ground, a mile above earth, and you are on a very thin bridge. And the bridge is a mile long, okay? Under the bridge, Tony, is volcano and lava and smoke and fire. And you're holding your two young kids and you have to get to the beginning of the bridge to safety to the other side of the bridge, okay? 
Now you have your two young kids in your arms and you're walking. Now who's the person in front of you that's guiding you? Mm. It's the person you love and trust the most. Is that your mother, your father, your spouse, your husband, your wife? Now, the smoke, Tony, from the ground is so blinding at times, you have to put your hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you just to get you, um, just so they can help guide you to safety on the other side. Mm -hmm. Before Mm -hmm. you know it, Tony, you don't even realize it, the bridge collapses and you start to fall and you got your two babies in your hand and you know you're falling to your death. Your brain is completely hijacked. Uh, You can't think, you're in pain. And while you're falling, you look up and you see the person that you loved and trusted the most has a hammer in their hand. They're the one that broke the bridge. <laughs> then you fall to your ground that's on fire, but you don't die. You got to get up with your kids and you got to learn how to live. That's where I come in. Wow, that is quite a description. <laughs> and I think that, you know, emotionally, that can be quite accurate. You know, I had, I've had my trauma uh, and, uh, you know, it is... It's been, they've been debilitating. They've been definitive. Uh, they have been altering, life altering, you know. Especially because- when it's from a primary attachment, a boss, a parent, a child. Um, uh, we can even have be- betrayal trauma from ourselves, our own body or our creator. Um, and then most certainly from a significant, significant other. And that's what hurts the most is the person you trusted the most in life totally. who took the best of you and used it against you. Yeah, and you know, I, I even contend that when we when we have a, a betrayal or a trauma in that regard, uh, emotionally the loss the, 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 there's there's a number of dynamics certainly, but including the feeling the the emotional idea of loss because that thing that I trusted I find now is no longer trustworthy. Same freaking feeling of when a, a close loved one dies and now it's lost. Now obviously there's no betrayal and death. But what, but the feeling of loss is the same to betrayal where I, I loved and now the love is gone. Uh, you know, that's the idea of it. You know, the emotions like, oh my God, it's it's like, so I've been betrayed and it felt like a sudden loved one suddenly died. You know, and obviously again, there's more dynamics there, but certainly that's how incredible it is. Yeah, yeah. The the um certainly loss, you know, a lot of it you can boil down to grief and sadness, you know, most mm-hmm. certainly. I will say though, betrayal trauma is its own secret society. And the reason being is because hypothetically speaking, if you lose a parent, you can call your job and say, Listen, I just lost my dad. I need some bereavement time. And you're gonna get, you know, three, four days off, maybe a week off. You're gonna get some coworkers that come over with some macaroni and cheese and pizza. You're gonna get the saris, you're gonna get the flowers. You can't call your job after you find out your spouse cheated on you and say, I need some uh I, I, you know, I need some infidelity time. There's no such thing. Um, and if you do want to share with your boss why you need time off, then you need to open up and be honest with your boss. And that comes with a bunch of shame and guilt and embarrassment. So betrayal trauma is its own secret society. You can't, you know, you can't go to your friends or family half the time and tell them your spouse cheated on you because A, um, even though they have the best intentions, they don't necessarily have the best advice. And then B, if you decide to reconcile with your spouse, now your friends and family are calling you stupid for reconciling. So it's its own secret society, which makes it far more frustrating right. when you do be trade. And let totally. me just tell you this. I don't know yeah, how close. Let, 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 before you go on, Jay, let me include that. You already mentioned shame, but there's also an element of shame where people, if they, they, they're, they're reluctant to communicate it because the idea there's some rather ridiculous notion, but I think it's pretty pervasive, is that if someone cheated on me, it must be because I'm less than, I'm not yes. worthy to, to yes. have maintained that fidelity because I have some shortcoming uh, or, or, you know, so there's that idea. I, I, it may be ridiculous, probably is, <laughs> uh, but I think that it's a very human reality. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. A lot of these feelings, Tony, happen regardless of the decisions. Like for instance, if you decide to leave there's some shame with that. There's guilt with that. There's a lot of struggles, whatever. If you decide to stay and reconcile, there's shame and guilt. Because if you leave, now you have guilt of, geez, did I give up so early? Or am I taking my children away from their parents, whatever. But if you decide to stay, now you have a lot of shame and guilt of what I don't deserve better. I got to stay in this. So there's shame. There's a lot of the similar feelings, no matter what decision you make, which is why, you know, betrayal is often very difficult. Um, I don't know how close we are to a um, break because I wanted to talk quickly about primal panic. 
We'll take the break now, and then we'll come back with Primal Panic. That's awesome. I'll panic on you. Great stuff, Mr. J. We'll come right back with Mr. J. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. People start something, then something comes up, or they need a break or even a vacation, and they often never get back on track. Perficio is designed to allow all of this. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can live your life as you learn and make progress toward your life-changing goals. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having a incredible conversation with Mr. J about trauma and betrayal. And now we're getting to, into something called primal panic. Ooh, this is intriguing. Tell me about primal panic. <laughs> All right. So let me just say this. Uh, do you ever watch those shows, those nature shows, or maybe some uh, 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 television of, you know, where they're doing tests on monkeys or whatever? Basically, when you try to take a baby monkey from its mother, it goes completely insane, spastic, out of control. It doesn't know anything at all except it wants to reattach, okay? It will scream and bite and whatever. It wants to reattach back to its safety. Here's what's, here's what's, what's profound about betrayal. When we discover the lipstick in the car door or the hair in our car that's not ours or, you know, the phone numbers underneath our mattress, when we discover what happens is our body goes into an immediate primal panic mm. where intellectually our front, front prefrontal cortex logically absolutely is thinking something's off now something is wrong at the same token what's happening is our prefrontal cortex is getting hijacked because our amygdala uh, is kicking in which is our animal you know part of our brain which is all emotion so basically what happens is all at one time we're like that baby monkey who wants to go back to what's safe, which is why you hear from so many people that are devastated. This can't be true. This can't be true. They wouldn't do this to me. This can't be, true. even though they, they did. And it, and it is true. There's no way. There's no way. That's primal panic. We want to go back and get safe into that attachment. But at the same token, that attachment is what hurt us profoundly. And so there's this struggle. And that and in that struggle, that's where you find people that are vomiting, that are crying, that are screaming to God, no, please, this can't be true. So I just want to, the reason I brought up primal let, panic is because- let, let me compliment that before you continue, Jay. Uh, you know, I'm a pretty calm cookie, all right? Uh, and I, I think that's like a hallmark of myself. But, you know, in situations like you described and- these traumatic situations or these ideas of betrayal. I thought I have found that my neurology has lit up in such a way that I, where I, I maintain my external calmness, you know, I, I won't be, a, but it's my, I feel my neurology lighting up and, and in a way that is unnormal, abnormal and unsettling because it's exactly what you just described. There is something else that lights up there, that neurology, this, this detachment this from the mother, you know, that I was like, whoa, you know, I, I'm not, I, can't, I usually I can, I manage my thoughts, but then my thoughts are like compulsive, racing. Oh boy, it's a whole other situation. Yeah, um, which by the way, um, I always thought that a calm Italian was an oxymoron, but hey, maybe I'll, I'll be proven wrong, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, um, uh, a lot of times this is why there's something called, um, uh, I forget the term, but basically it's called um, hyper bonding right after somebody finds a betrayal. Um, what happens oftentimes with people, and the reason I'm bringing this up again, Tony, is because if somebody's listening and they're doing this, I want them to know it's natural, common, and they're not crazy. They're not going crazy. Their body's traumatized. What happens a lot of times is people that have discovered a betrayal, especially from, you know, a, a spouse, what happens is that they become astronomically sexually active. Now, you think that's counterintuitive. They're like, well, they're, they're disgusted. They're pulling away. But here's the deal. Our body wants to do a couple of things. Number one, it wants to reclaim what's ours. And it also wants to uh, go back and relive what they believe they missed and experienced. So what you're doing is you're going into this hyper bonding mode where people right after you discover your spouse has been unfaithful, you're sexually active with them three, four times a day for sometimes weeks on end. Again, this is your body's way of, I need to you know claim what was mine. I need to connect with 
you know, something that I thought I was about to lose. And I want to know what, what, you know, what did I miss out on you? So the, our body goes into this, what's called hyper bonding thing. Now, a lot of now, and I'll tell you another thing too, Tony. And again, I'm just, I'm mentioning a bunch of things. I'm going all over the place. Cause I want to give it the it. most amount of information in the most limited time we have. A lot of people, I want them, I want them to understand they're not going crazy. If they actually get sexually excited and sexually stimulated, even thinking about their partner with the other partner. Now, you might be th- people might be thinking, that's crazy. Who is this nut job you have on your show? But the reason for that is because that is one of our body's way of trying to reclaim the past. Um, this is why sometimes when we want to understand something, it, we go over it in our mind constantly. Uh, th- when we get excited, stimulated, thinking about our partner with somebody else, that's our body's way of wanting to go back in time and reclaim and redeem lost moments. Um, it gets kind of very interesting and, and things like that. Now I tell people all the time when it comes I to, can, I can totally validate, obviously you're the expert in this area, but I can totally validate it. Uh, that everything you said is absolutely profoundly true. <laughs> it is so true. That, you know, and, and I've never needed a coach, bro. maybe I should have, you know, in interpersonal trauma, but I gotten past it for the most part, you know, I, I'm, hiding, I'm hiding my dysfunction, uh, but uh, no, that you're all totally, functional, dysfunctional people. Yeah, you're totally correct. Definitely. There's unequivocally, unequivocally. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that I tell people to do, um, and this is difficult because a lot of times people will get a hold of me um, years after the betrayal. Because I always tell people, Tony, I always say you got to be very, very careful, very careful of what you tell yourself. Our dialogue is is powerful because one of the primary reasons is because we narrate, then we ruminate, and then we marinate. <laughs> and once we start to marinate, that's when the neural pathways in our brain start to solidify like concrete. Mm-hmm. And now it's almost impossible to undo. Wow. It's not impossible, but it's a, a, so we have to be. And this is why, Tony, this is why it's uh, we have to I always say betrayal trauma hits us at our core insecurities. Mm-hmm. So if you are betrayed, it's going to, you're going to go to your core insecurity and it's going to open up that manifest, that blow that out of breath, which is why a lot of times when I'm talking to a couple, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, it's a male, female couple. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, the male is the one that stepped out of the relationship and, and committed adultery or had an act of unfaithfulness. Immediately, I can pick up a core insecurity because the female might say, I can't believe you did this to me. Do you think I'm that wor- unworthy? Do you think I'm, I'm that, you don't, you don't, think I'm that worthy? Well, now she's telling me she has a core insecurity of unworthiness. Yes. Yeah. And the next woman might say, I can't believe you would do this. Do you think I'm that ugly? Well, right. thank you there for you telling go. me one of your insecurities. Right. So, um, so here's the deal. You got to be careful what you tell yourself because the infidelity had nothing to do with your core insecurities, but that's what we attach it to. So we sell, so we narrate and then we ruminate on that and then we marinate. And what happens, Tony, is that we, all of these techniques that we, um, that we uh, put on ourselves, if we don't heal them, they eventually evolve and morph into our personality. Wow. And then we take our new personality into the world or into relationships. Tony, that's not who we are. It's who we've become based on our betrayal and our circumstances. Right. So you got to be very very right, careful so, so you'll, you know so your scar tissue you can you can think that that's who you are but this yes. is this is it's not you know this is only because you haven't healed from it uh why it's why it's, it's so significant yes and i'll tell you something the other thing too is that and i hate to say this because some people are very proud of their scar tissue and some yes. people want to be married to their scar, t- scar yes. tissue more than yes. they want to be married to healing um, you know, I can't talk, I can't tell you how many times I ask in a day, listen, do you want to be married to your story or do you want to be married to healing? You can't be married to most. Do, do what's, what, what do you prefer? What do you prioritize being right or being happy? Cause oftentimes you can't have them both. Listen, I understand. And I'm going to really pee off a lot of people that are listening. I understand we get false benefits from staying in a victim. We get to be the victim. We get all of the sympathy and the empathy and, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we, we, we don't get to do the hard work to heal. We don't have to do the hard work to fall in love again. There's a lot of false um, rewards we get staying a victim. But you know what I say about that? 
take your best TV cook, whether it's Meryl or, or I don't know, whoever is your, your favorite cook is on TV. If he gets burned while he's making uh, a meal, it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt a lot. And you know something? He has every right to say, I just got burned badly. I'm never going to cook another meal again. He has every right to do that. But my God, think of all the delicious gourmet meals that he's going to miss out on experiencing and everybody else around him because he chose to live in his the pain of his healing as opposed to saying, crap, I got burned. It didn't feel good. It wasn't my fault, but I want to keep moving. I want to keep cooking. Absolutely. So people that are traumatized, yes, you're in profound pain. Tony, I tell people all the time, when you discover your spouse is unfaithful, you might as well take a raw butter knife and gut your stomach and have all the contents in your body just fall out. Yep. You are depleted of life itself. Betrayal right. trauma right. affects mind, body, soul, universe, your whole life. When you are betrayed, especially from a significant other, you just not only not trust them, you start to question yourself. Right. You start to question right. the world around you. Oh my God, can I trust my boss? Can I trust my mother? Can I trust your whole world is, 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 uh, completely diluted and blurred, not to mention the filters in your head, which is why I say you got to be very careful what you put in your head because you're running them through your faulty filters. Don't believe everything you think after betrayal. I say that all the time. Yeah. Don't believe everything yeah. you think. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Definitely. You know, and I like to also add that, you know, talking about making these choices that are, are not the best. Uh, and I learned this from my my mentor, well, I'm not really his protege anymore, but he was he was a mentor to me. He was my primary pre uh, teacher of neuro-linguistic programming. And he also had a, an accompanying thing called mind design. So I consider myself a mind designer where we're always, you know, making, improving ourselves. Anyway, he said that, you know, very often, you know, everybody has a choice practically constantly, whether they choose diamonds or dog shit. People will surprise you and often choose dog shit. Okay, okay. Diamonds on one hand, dog shit in the other, and they go, give me the dog shit <laughs> to use that term. That was, and, and it's so true. And, and so I would go about my life subsequently to that training and see how often people chose dog shit. I was like, wow, Rex was totally right. Why are they making this choice? Well, I would say that they have some trauma that they haven't resolved. And so dog shit to them is a better choice than the diamonds, which is just in the other hand. It's, it's not far away. It's just on the other hand, but the dog shit is more familiar. It's and it's it works for the way they think. So give me that dog shit. And what can yeah. you do? There's nothing yeah. you you know. I, I'm actually Jay. You, you know, you know. Long long ago, I learned that you know both. This is when I was in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, and then certainly as you know, when I became a life coach, that you can't help people who don't want to be helped. You know, and that's 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 basically true however i'm there there is i, I have a i'm back on a reality show where i'm going to actually see if i can uh make an exception to that rule i think that in a, in a if you can orchestrate a situation and bring pressure to bear that in a certain situation uh, you can get that to that point but only with and this is a radical experiment if you will uh and it's a re it's, it's a reality show to actually start someone without his permission ultimately i'll have to get his permission <laughs> where i'm gonna help this poor mofo despite his his resistance his reluctance because i think you have to have in in this case in, in this situation you have to have the outcome that they want and then you bring it and then you bring it to bear and then and then they get to a point where they realize where the traumas that they've been that they that's that's has such a grip on them that they must heal from it and it has to be their choice of course because no one can make that choice for you but you have to but i think when enough pressure comes to bear a person usually it's you know it happens on your own everything happens not usually on your own time you're when you're ready you're ready and that's when you do what you do but the circumstances often are the the catalyst for that. Okay, you know, I'll, you know, and, and, yeah, it's an internal thing, but it can is an ex, it could be an external catalyst. And like, okay, I'm gonna change. You know, this for example, when I became sober, I heard, you know, I, I it took me eight years to get sober finally, and 600 times I quit using drinking and using drugs, but not until I heard the news of my sister's death, who was ironically killed by a drunk driver. That's when I said, that's it, I had enough. 
and I and I got humble enough and and did the work. Uh, so external event, internal process. I'm ready. All right. So and you know, so I'm doing this reality show, which I know is radical and can be controversial to make do a similar thing. But in the normal course of human events, it's the same friggin' thing. External events, and I all of a sudden I become ready. But when you're ready to deal with this trauma. Um, you know, whether it be the thing that you specialize in or the things that underlie uh, what people are, are have a, a pathology for or whatever, that this thing that causes them to choose this dog shit, <laughs> then there they are. And they say, they come to you and say, help me, Jay. And you're there to help them, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. And, you know, I think the analogy with the dog crap is, is interesting. And yes, it, a lot of it does go back to familiarity, which is why I tell people all the time, if you are always finding yourself asking, why do I always date these losers? Why do I always attract this? And I say, well, who's the common denominator? Right. Um, because, you know, a, a lot of times we are attracted to what's familiar. A lot of times based on our childhood, how many times have you heard somebody say, I'm dating this guy and oh my God, he's just, he reminds me of my family. It's so awesome. Well, if you came from an abusive, toxic family, why are you so proud? Because I'm not really sure that's a, the healthiest environment. Absolutely. So, but again, um, uh, getting, allowing yourself to get uncomfortable so you can live comfortably is hard. A lot of people, especially in this day and age, I don't know what it is. A lot of people are like, this is who I am. And this is who I'll be. Oh and you God. won't change me. And this and that. Okay. How's that working out for you? Wonderful. Yeah, then you go be you. So yeah, you're right. As far as um, what you just said, I said at the beginning of the show, I can only turn the steering wheel on the ship. If nobody's going to row, we can't go anywhere. Now, having said that, there are times as a coach, you got to find how can I motivate this couple to want to change? Yeah. And yeah. if there's the circumstances and the criteria yes. and whatever, yes. however, uh, I, I can't, I can't load people in the boat and help. Them. I mean, you know, they, right. they, right. they got to most part do the work, but yes, one of the challenges as a coach is how could I best internally intrinsically motivate this person to want to value themselves enough to want to make those positive changes absolutely great stuff okay let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back with awesome <laughs> with jay jay i tell you man this this has been a fantastic discussion okay enough of that we'll come we'll come back in a moment this episode of self-help coaching is brought to you by perficio do you know why most wealthy people are that way it's because they think like wealthy people, and a fool and his money are soon parted. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P E R F I C I O.io, where you can actually transfer the wealth mentality into your own brain, and you will think wealth. You're listening to the Self Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having an incredible conversation with Mr. J talking about trauma, betrayal, uh, and the human experience in general, but especially in terms of relationships. Uh, let's get into the, my next question. What is betrayal blindness? Oh, betrayal blindness. Okay. So um, <clears throat> betrayal blindness is a, uh, is a nervous system response. It's actually made to help us. However, it does also hurt us. Um, so let me just uh, say this. I often refer to it as the Red Riding Hood syndrome. So Red Riding Hood was home and she, let's just say she was on lockdown from COVID. She couldn't leave her house for a couple of years. <clears throat> but she desperately wanted to go visit her grandmother. She couldn't see her grandmother. So they lifted the COVID restrictions and now she can go see her grandmother. So she bakes the bread and the banana cookies and the oatmeal cookies. And she's so happy. She puts them in her picnic basket and she trudges through the dangerous forest to get to her grandmother's house. The minute she opens the door, something in her body says, wait, something's off. And, and, and when she sees the wolf on the bed, she knows something's off. She, she knows it to the point where she even questions it. Grandma, why is your nose so long and your teeth are so sharp and your eyes are so beady? She knows something's off, but she ignored her intuition. And what happened? It was to her peril. She died. That's what we do, Tony. When we're in a relationship, and keep in mind, the more you are dependent and reliant upon the person, the more betrayal blindness is going to kick in. Yes. If you have kids with somebody and you are dependent on them financially, 
um, they have the car, they have the house, they have the property, you're going to have far more betrayal blindness than say you don't have any property together, you don't have any kids together, you're both working, you're both uh, contributing financially. So basically, betrayal blindness is this. If I were to accept, acknowledge, and investigate reality, my life is going to be completely turned upside down. So I'm going to be blind to this betrayal so I can just keep living in happy, bless, ignorance. Right, that's hoping betrayal. things will work out. Yeah, that's betrayal blindness. But the, so, so, so the problem with that, well, there's many problems with that, Tony, but one of the problems with that is after D-Day happened, which is the day of discovery, discovery day, once we <laughs> find the lip gloss in the car, or the hairs on our seat or the phone numbers for the hookers underneath our mattress or the history in our computer, once we find that, now not only are we dealing with the betrayal from our spouse, but we're also dealing with the betrayal that we gave ourselves for being so blind when we knew something was off. Now we have to go back and forgive ourselves, not only for the red flags, but for the pink flags that we ignored. <laughs> and this really starts to mess with us because we need our intuition. We need our intuition. And intuition, when we ignore it, gets very, very, very blurred and disturbed and, um, and, and, and it gets very ruined. So now people that are trying to heal are trying to heal in every way imaginable, yeah. plus trying to heal their intuition. Yeah, it's a big mess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a big round ball of, uh, and that's what grief is. You know, I don't know if you ever go to Staples or one of those home, home uh, office supply stores and you see a rubber band ball. Yeah. And yeah. I was teaching a class one time and I said, you know, everybody thinks that grief comes in stages. You know, first there's, you know, denial and then there's sadness and then there's bargaining and then there's this. And I show them these different, you know, rubber bands. I said, but if you want to get real and raw, and then I show them the ball. This is grief. Yeah, it's, it's all amazing. tangled up at whatever. And it doesn't come in these pretty, you know, wrapped up present stages. You know, oh, first right. there's shock and then there's disbelief and then there's bargain. Right. No, it's all at once. And that's why you're bear hogging the toilet, vomiting sometimes when you discover, you know, there's a betrayal in your life. One of the things I want to just tell people, though, because, the, you know, the, people might be listening now or in the future or whatever that are saying, OK, wonderful. Now, how do we heal from this? I just want to give a couple of quick tips. Please. Number one, I want you to uh, so many people that are healing from betrayal, from betrayal, from betrayal. You got to stop watching the second hand and you got to concentrate on the hour hand. <laughs> Nothing's going to heal at all. It, it, it's going to take. Listen, imagine yourself in a factory in a in a wig, a wig factory. Right. At the beginning of the line. There's the, the headpiece, right? It's just practice. It's just, it's just plastic. There's no hair fibers on that, correct? And at the very end, way on the very other end is a, is a whole wig, right? But all in the middle, people are adding individual hair fibers, right? So many times people want to walk into that factory and immediately say, okay, where's my hair? Where's my wig? I, I need healing. No, 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 no. You are on the other side of that line. You are just in the hairpiece, whatever. And it's going to take you hours, days, weeks, months before you even start to see two or three hair fibers on that plastic piece. Then as you go, you're going to see more. And eventually you'll be like, oh, this is starting to look like a toupee, not a wig, a toupee. Then eventually you'll say, I can see the wig coming to fruition. That's healing from betrayal. You got to stop looking at the second hand. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be three steps forward, two steps back, sometimes two steps forward, three steps back. That's where healing from betrayal is. You got to keep on keeping on. You got to do the hard work. Now, I want to give one more visual. Triggers. So many times I hear about people triggers. Oh my God, I'm triggered. And triggers, rumination, triggers are your emotional flooding. It's these flashbacks. They could literally take you down to your knees. You could be in the shower, doing dishes, making love to your reconciled partner, and all of a sudden get a flashback of their betrayal. And you are literally on your knees crying and you get a sledgehammer to your gut because you, you are right back into that. The body keeps the score with trauma. So anytime we're tr 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 triggered, we go right back to the trauma. What I tell people is this. Listen, imagine a box, okay? Imagine a big box. And um, there's a big balloon and it's filled with manure, okay? 
And on the bottom of that box is a sharp pin sticking up from that box. Okay. Initially, when we're betrayed, you're going to have so many triggers because what's going to happen is that balloon that's filled with manure is going to bounce in that box and it's going to eventually hit the pin. And, um, and because the balloon is so big and the box is so small, it's going to hit that pin often and it's going to explode. What do you got to do? You got to clean that manure, Tony, while you're still feeding your kids, while you're still going to work, while you're still trying to exercise, while you're still trying to maintain your life. Life doesn't stop just because you're betrayed. But here's the deal. You don't even get half of that manure cleaned up before the next balloon filled with manure lands on the pit <laughs> pops. So you can't keep up with the triggers. But here's the deal. With hard work and he with healing, eventually that balloon does start to get a little smaller. And while it's bouncing around, it gives you a little bit more time to put your nose above water to, to, to get a grasp on your healing. So when the balloon does hit the pin and it does pop, yes, it stinks. Yes, you got to clean it up. But now you know how to clean it up, the quickest way to clean it up, the best way to, for the solvents, all the, you know, whatever. Eventually, that balloon becomes so small that when it does hit it, you smell the manure, you notice the manure, you clean it up, you move on. Then with a lot of time and healing, Tony, that balloon gets so small, and then it's replaced from manure with glitter. <laughs> anyone, now, anyone that knows, you still have to clean up after glitter. It makes a big mess but it's a lot less smellier and it's a lot less ugly than manure. Oh. So now years, maybe even decades after betrayal, when you get a trigger, now instead of it bringing you down to your knees and you're crying like you were just hacked in the stomach with an ax, now the trigger is, oh yeah, that happened. Okay, and then you move on with your life. So, so there's a lot with healing. You gotta give yourself a lot of time, a lot of grace, a lot of kindness, and know that healing is not easy. Absolutely. Okay, you know, um, all right, let's take our final break. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll, it's unfortunate, it's the last segment, but that's every, every good thing has an ending. Great stuff. So I'm totally enjoying this conversation, Mr. J. Uh, and we'll come right back with Mr. J. This episode of Self Help Coaching is brought to you by Perfizio. What if there was a self improvement program truly personalized to you, that knew and cared for you deeply? that whatever was going on in your life adapted for you perpetually. Visit www.perphysio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O.io, where you can start a program that will always suit you, considering all the pressures and nuances of your life. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having an incredible conversation with Mr. J about trauma, about moving on. Well, not moving on, but healing. Uh, and which is, I think that's a lot of conflation between the two. <laughs> People who move, have, have a, they think moving on is geographic or just moving away from another person. Uh, but if they don't do the healing, you know, they haven't really moved anywhere. Um, so let's get, you know, you already got into it, but um, what other what other ways can a person deal with emotional triggers? You get you had a great description of with you, the balloon. How can they deal with emotional triggers after betrayal? I mean, some more substantive stuff. Can you get into any? Certainly. So a couple of things. First of all, I think it's very important that you understand and tell yourself triggers are here to inform us. They're not here to threaten us. Mm. The threat's already gone. The threat's already passed. It can no longer threaten us. Yes. It's just here to inform us. So one of the things we might want to do is talk to our trigger. Ask it, what are you trying to inform me? You know, mm. um, after you find out what it's trying to do, give yourself what you need. Oh my God, I'm feeling right now unsafe. Okay, what would make you feel safe? I think a hug would make you feel safe. Okay, if you're reconciling and your partner's there, Ask him or her to give you a hug. If your partner's not there or they're at work or you're not reconciling or they died, give yourself a hug. You know, whatever you need, give yourself. I need connection right now. Okay, then go and get connected. If that's with your priest, if that's with your parent, if that's with your significant other, whatever you need, give yourself. Um, uh, to challenge your triggers, another thing you can do is put a rubber band on and every time you get a trigger, snap it. Say, I'm not going to think of that. Nope, I'm not going to think of that. Another thing you can do is do what uh, Corey Ten Boom, Nelson Mandela, and Viktor Frankl did when they were thrown into concentration camps in prison. They added um, purpose to their pain. 
So they said, okay, you know what? Uh, um, I'm going to, um, yes, my destiny was disrupted, but I'm going to add purpose to my pain. And that's what they did. And, um, and that's why they were able to go on and have not, not just survive, but thrive and go on to have really productive lives. Um, so there's many things that we can do <clears throat> when it comes to our triggers. There's other things that we can do, which is called the rainbow technique. And one of the things that I do is because you have to ground yourself, because again, when your prefrontal cortex gets hijacked, your amygdala is, um, your, is kicking in, which by the way, I call amygdala Amy. Um, uh, um, and I have a, the females that I'm talking to a lot. I tell them anytime you're triggered, talk to Amy. She's your both best friend and your worst enemy. She's your best friend because she's always watching out for you to make sure you're safe, but she's also your worst enemy because you can be safe. And she's always telling you, oh my God, scan your surroundings. Are you safe? And you're like, hold on. I'm just buying bread at the store. You don't need to you talk to me right now, Amy. And then for guys, um, I uh, have them call it Elmo because uh, our amygdala is almond shaped. So almond, A-L-M-O. Um, they have, um, so again, talk to your triggers. Um, and so one of the things you have to do to ground yourself and to go back into, um, uh, your prefrontal cortex is the rainbow technique. So, you know, uh, look around you for every color of the rainbow and verbalize it. And the last thing that I'll say, and this is the craziest thing, but you know, try it out. It works immediately do some math problems. When our prefrontal cortex, which is the logical side of our brain, is completely hijacked, all that we have is the animalistic part of our brain that kicks in. And now we're, now we're going on feeling and emotion. And feelings are not facts, so we shouldn't go by them. So immediately what you should do is somehow either think or take out some math problems and start doing math problems because now you engage your frontal cortex, your logic side of your brain. And now you can start making decisions you know, from the logical aspect of your brain and not just the emotional part of your brain. Wow. I can go great. on and on, but those uh, Well, uh, people, uh, great, great stuff. That is sufficient. And if people uh, want more, they can go contact you. Speaking of which is how do people contact you? So basically I have the easiest website, I think on earth, it's mrjrelationshipcoach.com. That's it, Siri, very easy. But right. even if people come to my website and they never wanna talk to me, see me or hear from me, that's fine, great and dandy. Please just go to my website and see my many free resources. I have um, all kinds of free uh, research things. I have videos. I have, I mean, um, uh, healing products from scented candles. There were people, you know, smell lavender and get calm. I have all kinds of free resources on my website. So mrjrelationshipcoach.com. Even if you don't want a session, book a session with me, please come and take advantage of the many free resources. That's great. I understand you have quite a YouTube channel as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm on TikTok. I currently have over 11,000 followers on TikTok. Wow. TikTok. I also have a YouTube channel where every single day I upload some type of tip on healing uh, from betrayal or dealing with divorce or dealing with trauma or how to love ourselves after a breakup. So if you go to my YouTube channel, which you can find right off my website as well, every day I upload a clip and you can get that for free. Great. We're gonna we're gonna we'll create a profile on, on of yours on our website. We'll have all your social media there. This has been a wonderful, excellent conversation. I mean, not just, it's been so interesting for me, but it's been delightful to meet you and get to know you and to hear so much of your expertise, certainly very valuable to, I think, I mean, it's kind of a universal experience to have to be betrayed. Uh, so I think for just about everyone. Uh, it is. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Jay. Do you have any final uh, remarks for the audience? I just want to say very quickly is that other people cause us pain, but we cause ourselves suffering. If you were walking down the street and you get bit by a rattlesnake, you wouldn't pick up that snake and keep injecting poison into your skin. So why do you keep reliving the trauma that you went through? Nip it in the bud, replace it with something positive. And even if you can't replace the trauma with something positive, replace something good that came out of it, such as I'm becoming a better person. Don't become bitter, become better. So um, other people give us pain. Don't give yourself unnecessary suffering. Absolutely. Great stuff. Jay, it was such a pleasure. Great stuff. I really appreciate it. And remember, everyone, we're all responsible for ourselves and we could all use a little help. With that, my name is Tony. Thank you so much, Mr. Jay, for coming on. We'll Thank see you on the next episode of the Self-Help Coaching Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. 
learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. Remember to visit our website at self-healthcoaching.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast.